uh, great to have you guys here and look forward to this conversation. Um, as we saw in the previous panel, uh, clearly blockchain is the most sensational technology platform of our times. Um, the sensationalism is largely due to its origins in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because they deal with a very primal element of our lives, which is money. And money makes things very sensational and therefore we have seen this kind of, you know, glamorous sensationalism around this technology platform over the last eight or ten years. Um, so, so I would kind of characterize uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain uh, as, as the platform of consumer activism and therefore that revolution focused more on the consumer aspects. Uh, but I see two other aspects emerging. The second aspect which is, you know, creating new asset classes and which is what we have seen, uh, you know, with, with the uptick of cryptocurrencies and, and a lot of stock exchanges listing them and, and in, in some years, you know, you can expect your pension funds to have some exposure to cryptocurrencies and that has its own evolution. Uh, but we are here to talk about the third aspect uh, which in our opinion uh, and especially in my personal opinion is a lot deeper in consequence but a but lot less sensational which is how blockchain as a technology can quietly rewire the world we live in um, and especially do that by influencing the way enterprises operate internally, the way enterprises trade with one another and the way enterprises do business. Um, and therefore, you know, all the enterprises you're dealing with, insurance companies, banking companies, logistics, supply chain, industrial, auto, and so on and so forth, will change the way they offer services, will change the way you, you know, have experiences working with them. Um, and, and, and therefore, as, a, as an early stage fund and a venture studio, as, as Sammy pointed out, um, we are focusing on those applications uh, which may not seem or sound as sensational as, as some of the platforms we have seen in the last five years, but we strongly believe have much deeper consequences um, and therefore as a part of this conversation we want to kind of demystify some of the characteristic aspects of blockchain as a platform that has been discussed in the popular media vis-a-vis -vis consumer activism and, and and kind of point out characteristics that are more relevant when you look at blockchain as an enterprise platform um, and obviously dr. Mohan did uh, an amazing uh, you know concise but very deep presentation on highlighting those aspects um, um, and, and between Emmanuel and, and Sanjay, we have points of view from different emerging enterprise service and process stacks, which are you know getting restructured because of blockchain as an enabling change agent. Um, and, and, and I'm looking forward to points of view from the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance uh, that Dr. Mohan also pointed out in his presentation from, from Sanjay and especially Intel's involvement there. Uh, and the much anticipated uh, launch by Oracle uh, and, and, and to see um, what that means because we know when when oracle does something it has you know it's it's business process angle it's uh, you know kind of business engagement angle figured out in a quite unique manner um, so so maybe we can kick start this panel uh, uh, mohan with you uh, and and your kind of view on uh, how blockchain as a technology the way we have understood it from the cryptocurrency bitcoin era uh, needs to be rewired uh, and re-understood uh, as it has to be applied in the enterprise use cases yeah i mean some of you already i assume were here <laughs> most of you probably uh, and you heard me talk about uh, you know what the private blockchain is all about and in terms of you know the things that need to be done uh, as i mentioned existing applications have to be rewritten there's no question about it it's not like you know, you leave things the way they are and roll in this new piece of software, install it, and suddenly the world will be a better place for you. Absolutely not. There, is, there does have to be changes in the way you do things. This is no different from the good old days with workflow management systems. Just bringing in the system by itself without the people changing their habits and so on would have made any difference. So from that perspective, things are different. But also, you know, as usual, you have to think about how to marry the membership services mm -hmm. with what's already in your organization with respect to, you know, how you define who your employees are and such things, X.500 and all those sorts of things, you know. So there are many issues which come into play when you have to integrate this new piece of technology or new software, at least, uh, into what's already in your organization. And of course, you know, in this case, because it involves multiple organizations and they might have used different kinds of technologies for some of these things, 
it might not be as easy a thing to do but the good point is once you do that then a lot of the bad things about the current way of doing business where there may be a lot of back and forth that goes on uh, reconciliation and such things uh, transparency that's not there that would be good to have and things like that is what the benefits would be so it's not without its pains is my point that the, the migration from where Absolutely. we are to where we would, we would like to be and in order to benefit from the 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 advantages that the new way of doing business brings with it Absolutely. And the way of doing business in an enterprise is largely defined and driven by its business process and the structures of business processes they have. And therefore, when you introduce blockchain in an enterprise, if it's just a point service or a point application and just shoved into an existing business process, you're not really transforming the way the enterprise operates. You're just adding a new application. And, and therefore, the value of blockchain is limited to what that activity in the business process uh, can lend itself to add. There's one other thing I'd like to add. Uh, this has to do with if you're thinking of the food supply chain or any other kind of supply chain, there may be players there who are itsy bitsy players who might not have the wherewithal or whatever resources to play as an organization. So in such instances, you might have to think uh, more imaginatively about these little players forming a cooperative <laughs> or some such thing and then that entity becoming the organization. So strictly speaking, you shouldn't think of this, you know, private blockchain as applicable only in the enterprise context. I think that's a bit of a misnomer. It could be applied even in the business to customer. As I said in my presentation, you do have individual users who are the clients and whether those are ordinary kind of customers or they are the users within a big enterprise is subject to interpretation and uh, Absolutely. Emmanuel, maybe if you could chime in from a business process angle, be it a B2C retail type enterprise or a B2B industrial type enterprise. Uh, of course, uh, you know, maybe in a lot of things internally you may not be able to reveal, but if you could give us a perspective of how does blockchain redefine the application layer of the enterprise stack. Um, key thing to remember as well is, you know, the, we've done a great job in building many monolithic applications mm -hmm. that do not interconnect or have any understanding of the boundaries that, you know, outside their own organization. So what blockchain really does is it allows us to redefine the contracts between how we do business. Not just from a personal perspective or just from a transactional perspective, but also on an application perspective. So we can now start thinking of, you know, I, I always say to people, we're doing a lot of work in migrating people to microservices and people are breaking large monolithic apps into smaller, understandable um, functional components. And think of smart contracts as, as another uh, microservice in that sense. So you are breaking areas of applications that requires consensus with disparate organizations outside of a monolith so that you can share state or share data. So in your use case, I would always say to people when it comes to looking at, you know, food, whether supply chain or any issues, I always say focus on problems that relate to trust, right? Blockchain solves that. It gives you trust as a service to a large degree. So what you do is you look at a particular process and you look to modify that process knowing that trust is now going to be decentralized. Do not try and take an existing problem and overlay blockchain on top of that. You're not going to reap the best rewards as a result. Absolutely. And when we, when we talk about trust, we've already gone through kind of two cycles of redefining trust. One was the cloud computing as a paradigm um, where your business processes and application had to be hosted on a third party uh, infrastructure that was not controlled by you. Uh, and then more recently, uh, trust has been in the conversation of big data and analytics. Uh, of course, in the, in the popular debate, you know, the whole Cambridge Analytica crisis. Um, but there has been a need for redefining trust when it comes to sharing data and, and sharing data with analytics platforms. Uh, we'd love to hear Sanjay's point of view, uh, you know, given kind of Intel's hard uh, uh, kind of push for uh, hardware-driven trust, but can interoperate in, in all kinds of third-party infrastructure as well. So like, uh, there are uh, two, two things here. Like, today, as you said, is like uh, data moves towards the compute and uh, and that's been good, like, you know, uh, all of us have benefited from that. Uh, but it has its pros and it has its cons, right? And, uh, and if you view it in the, uh, you know, viewport of a blockchain principles, 
so like uh, there's a form of it goes against the de decentralization thing yep. uh, so this is where I uh, see like uh, what's going to happen is and and the backbone of this is this decentralization of trust is that the compute starts to move towards data uh, wherein you have better controls uh, of uh, around the data uh, and it's in generally better like you know uh, one of the things with the blockchain is like you know you have uh, redundant compute happening so many times right uh, while uh, it has its benefits uh, side effects of it is like you know the heat generated how do you dissipate that and things like that so like this whole uh, uh, what we feel is like something that was still a centralized data centers and things like that that might get moved towards the uh, around and uh, so, so that's that's one side uh, that we are seeing uh, uh, something like this change. Yeah. Yeah. To, to add to that, the abstractions in how you know you allow the developer to interact with data needs to be. We need to do a better job at things like that, and that's some of the things we're looking at at Oracle. So, you know, right now people are looking at you know DAGs or you know UTXO model. Mm -hmm. You're getting Bitcoin in Hyperledger, Fabric, you're looking at key value store. Well, realistically, everyone always talks about big data, but then they always want to do queries. Data is usable when you can draw correlations to it. So allowing greater abstractions on how people can draw data out of blockchain is going to have greater value, including how do you do analytics? Can you do that in real time on a blockchain? Or do you need a side database to do that? I think those are, those are what we're hearing from customers as well. Um, and just to touch on what we wanted to say in regards to Oracle, we are launching an enterprise grade blockchain platform for our customers in the next couple of months. And it's going to basically be a platform that allows our customers to benefit. But not only that, um, Oracle itself, have, we have over 10,000 applications. Our own applications can benefit from greater connectivity or sharing a single source of truth between various organizations via consortia or simply by subscription. So those are the things we're looking at. It's, you know, we're, with internet, we're not talking about TCP IP anymore. We're not talking about packet switching. We're talking about the applications that are built on top of this infrastructure. And I think it will be the same thing once we start talking about apps in the enterprise blockchain space and really we've won the war. Absolutely, absolutely. So should I Yes, uh, please. I'd like to actually use this panel also to communicate what the different organizations are doing. Yes. So along those lines, um, a few things that I didn't get to say. Uh, for instance, uh, IBM people are working on, in fact, it was um, even talked about briefly yesterday in the uh, boot camp. Uh, my colleague uh, Shweta talked about the fact that we are looking at, uh, she's actively working on it actually, um, taking Ethereum contracts and making them run in the fabric environment. Because there's so much talent out there, knowledge out there in terms of Ethereum since it's been around for a while now. Even if guys like me don't like the open blockchain aspect of it, <laughs> maybe we can leverage it in the private blockchain environment. And it's no different from the enterprise Ethereum Alliance trying to do the same thing, yeah. right? So in that context, uh, that's one piece of work that's going on. In due course of time, you can imagine what I talked about with respect to uh, the composer, which today works with the fabric, it could actually be made to also spit out stuff that then works with one of the other kinds of uh, blockchain platforms. So along those lines, I would like to hear from you, <laughs> Sanjay, about uh, what exactly is happening with EEA. Oh, uh, so, so the thing is like, uh, EEA has been around for a, a good year yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and I uh, believe somebody even said it's dead. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? It's dead. dead. So there was uh, things like that. Um, it, it, uh, you have to go back a little bit towards what caused it to form, right? Uh, it was the interest in Ethereum uh, that led to, hey, if it's good for public space, smart contracts, Turing complete, all that stuff. So let's apply it to enterprise. Uh, so while that was a good idea, so a few things happened is like, you know, uh, there was fragmentation of code bases. Uh, so that was one thing. And then again, people realized like, you know, hey, uh, when we talk about enterprises, uh, what, what we have this thing called three P's, uh, permissioning, performance, and privacy. So how do you do that? Uh, and uh, that further, like, you know, you had different people coming with different approaches. And that's not good for an ecosystem in the sense like, you know, when you're looking for a solution that is quote unquote a standard. Yeah. So 
so that's uh, that had its uh, growing pains <laughs> and uh, now basically the thing is like you know uh, i do believe that we have gotten our act together uh, we have already uh, published a stack that is uh, uh, you know backed by like five implementations um, and uh, so, so quorum is just one of them is it uh, quorum would be yeah is yeah. there and then the thing is that uh, we are looking into uh, you know taking the three p's very seriously in terms of uh, permissioning right uh, what would it mean uh, privacy right you know there is uh, uh, there's no one answer to privacy and then there are shades of privacy right uh, what do you want to keep private uh, mm -hmm. how long you want to keep private uh, who do you want to keep private from and sometimes it's like it's okay to give it but permissioning is well, who who is the transaction between so, so we are uh, coming to these, uh, you know, trying to answer these these very very hard problems in a standards way. So, uh, so, uh, so that's uh, why you know it's not uh, easy. And then uh, next thing is your scaling, uh, because uh, while you said like seven to ten transactions per second uh, may be okay, but when, uh, in uh, in the where we are with the public chains, but when it comes to uh, enterprise, uh, you know, we are. Minimum is like you know hundreds, thousands, hundred. Uh, th that's where where it starts to become interesting. So how do you scale? Uh, what are good solutions out there in terms of on-chain scaling, off-chain scaling? Uh, how do we use things like uh, uh, trusted execution environments in that space? Because uh, right now one of the things with the public chains is like you know uh, uh, they uh, discount TEs as something not good. Uh, or something that is like you know controlled, or something like that, which is a little bit of a um, not really accurate. So, so, so some of those things is like you know how we can utilize those kinds of assets uh, to do scale better and things like that. So you will see some of that. Uh, obviously, I cannot seal the thunder out of before consensus, <laughs> but but you will see some of that uh, uh, you know in next terms week. of like it coming out uh, coming together. Okay. So next week there will be something. Yeah. Something is there. Thank you. Yeah. Emmanuel, do you want to share something about the upcoming Oracle service to the sure, extent we can, can learn from you? Sure. What I can say is, we what we're launching essentially is um, a platform that allows our customers to take advantage of a fully managed blockchain instance, so they can come to Oracle Cloud essentially set up and bring up a blockchain instance very, very rapidly and develop their applications in that environment. On top of that, it's going to be fully... We're well, it's based on Fabric. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, that's we're probably not everybody uh, Let, let yeah, me touch on that, public, actually. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So we're, we're adopting the open <laughs> standard, Apple Edge of Fabric, um, that is um, large code base IBM contributed to, and we're part of that consortium. We'll be contributing code as well. So it will be fully interoperable with other Fabric nodes, so there's no fear of vendor lock-in or anything else. Uh, as a matter of fact. And on top of that as well, if you remember, blockchain is a, as a platform. There are other app vertically facing applications within Oracle that would take advantage of it as a platform, which would obviously benefit our own customers in terms of greater efficiency organ within an organization with various applications employed within Oracle and also outside Oracle as well. Awesome, awesome. So in terms of the way it would integrate with other Oracle applications, I mean, Oracle obviously has a very rich ecosystem of both cloud-bound and uh, business process, hardcore finance type applications. Is there any thought process or, or ability to interoperate that might come yeah, up they're, they're, in the future? There are various ways. Obviously, the standard REST, standard SDK methodologies, but also Oracle has a class of integration application suites that enables you to model your data, bring that into um, <coughs> the Oracle Autonomous Blockchain Cloud Service, as we call it. So, you know, we're, we are employing various existing Oracle application suites that allows you to bring data and then integrate that directly with the blockchain as well. So, so one of the interesting questions to address would be, for instance, would some nodes of a network be on the, let's say, the IBM mm -hmm. blockchain as a service offering, whereas other nodes are on your uh, blockchain as a service offering and still constitute a single blockchain network? Yes. Yes, okay. so we will be fully interoperable with anyone that's running a high pledge of fabric, whether it's on IBM or whether it's anybody on else. anybody else on bare metal, yeah. 
Mohan, any? Uh, I, I think you gave a very detailed yeah, presentation I, I've, of I've Hyperledger. Yeah, pretty much, uh, more or less complete uh, description of the stuff. The, the the one difference that I was trying to point out, which might not have come across very well, is the fact that with that Intel secure execution environment, what I've seen so far, you know, even Berkeley people talking about, is the fact that the amount of resources that can be under that uh, secure execution is such that they cannot run, for instance, the whole fabric itself over there. Only the smart contract can be run in that secure mode. Whereas with this IBM uh, mainframe offering, it has almost limitless resources. So the whole fabric code itself can be run there and thereby guarantee that even the fabric code cannot be tampered with, let alone the smart contract code. So it's feature differences like that that also uh, is something that IBM would like to characterize as a big advantage. And so for those of you who think mainframes are dead, that's far from the truth, <laughs> so get real. <laughs> uh, this is Linux operating system running on the mainframe, which is the offering. And of course, that has its own set of issues, right? So there are some people who would like to be able to take even their own private clouds uh, nodes yeah. and make them become part of such a network. Yeah. And to some extent, the, the issue is, this is probably a more general thing that's worth discussing, which is, as you saw in that picture of the three-stage execution of the transaction, this ordering service yes. is talking to all the nodes in that network, yeah. or at least in that channel, let's yeah. say. Does that necessarily mean those peer nodes, which represent different organizations, have to be on the public cloud? Yeah. Or can they be Privately. behind firewalls? Yeah. Are you able to tunnel through? It turns yeah. out Ripple and such systems have been built in a way where they can actually have nodes behind the behind firewall. firewall. Yes. Yep. And they're able to tunnel through firewalls. So issues like that would be interesting ones to wrestle with as we go on. But like I said, we are still in the initial stages of all this, but already, as I said, there are production deployments, so IBM has been very proud of the fact that even with the 0.6 release yeah. of the fabric, there were already production deployments and a lot of them are being migrated now to the 1.0 release. One thing I'll touch upon is, you know, this is a very new space and it's rapidly growing. It's always evolving. So one thing, operation, people who are, you know, looking to employ a blockchain solution should be wary of, especially if you're going to production, is what we call technology churn. Namely, you invest $100,000 in implementation today, you now have version one or version two of, an app of, a, of a protocol come out the next day, and now you have to reinvest in the re-architecture. So, you know, something like that is what Oracle is looking to take care of from a customer perspective. So as you migrate from version to version, we try and at least dampen that effect. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, this space is um, you know, fraught with, I'll say, many ill-conceived use cases, um, <laughs> probably because you know, everyone hears blockchain and you, people come up to you and say, okay, I, I want to use blockchain to solve X, Y, and Z, <laughs> and that has got no connotation. Or it, it, there's no trust issue in that particular problem, and they're the only customer, they're the only participant. So <laughs> when that is, you, know, you have to be able to identify clearly what a use case is versus not. And I would say, uh, you, you even talk to companies who are saying, uh, we want to employ a blockchain to um, you know, prevent banks from taking us out as a payment processor. My question to them is, okay, well, why do banks want to take you away as a payment processor? Well, because all we do is charge fees. And like, so, <laughs> so just because you implement blockchain is, doesn't mean, you know, that people are going to adopt your service. You're the problem. So there'll be many businesses overall today that will not exist in five to ten years' time. So you have to really investigate the disruption that's coming and take adequate steps to ensure that you're part of that disruption rather than being disrupted. But of course, as usual with any new technology, you know, if you are the first one to adopt it, maybe you'll get some benefit compared <laughs> to your competition. So it's always a trade-off that you have to, of course, worry about. The other thing that um, I wanted to say is that, um, you know, yeah, things do change and there is an attempt, of course, with some of us enterprise people to try to maintain upward compatibility and things like that. And so over time, that will evolve and there's also all these other issues that keep getting brought up on-chain versus off-chain. And that was Correct. one of the bullets yes. I had in my, yeah. you know, umpteen different ways in which things can be done kind of chart. Um, this has become a very uh, favorite topic of some people, you know, they say, oh, blockchain has this immutability characteristic. So once I stick something there, it lives there forever and hence, uh, you know, I don't want to put some personally identifiable information and so on. This is a complete misnomer in my mind. But then they claim, okay, so let's stick the actual data 
in an off-chain regular kind of database and then take the hash of that thing and stick it in the blockchain. And they think they've solved this problem. I'm like, what the heck? I've been in the database business forever. The log in the database system also has that history there. Correct. It's no different from the blockchain having the history. Yeah. So as long as the log exists, you even if you delete that object from that external database, it's not like it really vanished from Earth. And in fact, GDPR is now yeah, putting even more, uh, yeah. you know, monkey wrench on all this. So yeah. in due course of time, of course, you can think about even in the blockchain world, anathema to some people, but thinking about forgetting some past stuff. Yeah. And this whole notion of how you initialize a site is also mind-bogglingly inefficient now. Whenever you bring in a new node into an existing network, they say all you can do is grab the blockchain from the other node, one of the other nodes. You can verify it because of all this hashing and all that. And then you start from time zero and you reconstruct the whole damn state to the current state. Imagine if it had been around for three years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you may not ever catch up, you know? That's so yeah. things like what we do in traditional database, database systems system. where you take a copy from one of the other guy's yeah. state databases and then Replicate. catch up yep. is what we'd have to do. But this again is thought of for the purist as something, oh, you can't do that. Or if your smart contract had some bugs in it and it messed up your database, we have point in time Good recovery luck. in traditional yeah. database systems Correct. to deal with Correct. it. And so we are getting customer requirements Absolutely even on our blockchain as a service about things like, can I do a point in time recovery where I have amnesia about what happened between the time I installed this buggy smart contract and then it went and clobbered my database state and then going back to that point and then saying the rest of the stuff that happened is poof, gone. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's another challenge. So one of my portfolio companies, it's called Zaid Security. It's a platform built on Hyperledger currently on uh, point six. Uh, but migrating to one but two soon. Um, so the issue we had was the the state change uh, blockchain. Um, while it's it's great, I mean it, it scales up to you know 20 plus nodes with the PBFT implementation. I think the one dot two version has better scalability. Yeah. The only gap we found there was the key management, especially when you're trying to uh, lock straight transitions which are signed by people who are across organizations and therefore their certificate routes are different. They're not part of the same Active Directory or root certificate structure. Um, and, and we had to do a dirty workaround uh, to get around it. Uh, but the use case, in, for example, in that company is in the industrial cybersecurity space and therefore the certificate is usually signed uh, between a service provider of an industrial operator and the industrial operator itself. And therefore they belong to two different organizations. And for example, when you're taking an asset out for maintenance, and the service provider comes in, uh, serve, uh, offers the maintenance service, and then you're bringing the asset back into production. So the certificate gets rotated twice. Uh, mm. And therefore, each certificate rotation, the counterparties signing it are not in the same organization. Uh, and, and, and therefore, the key management becomes a very important aspect. Um, and, and therefore, in use cases like that, imagine doing this even without blockchain at all, right? The traditional way of doing it, where it's all paper-based. Mm. The person comes in, there is a worksheet, uh, you sign it, and you give the asset and then come back. And which is horrendously inefficient because it's, it goes back 100 years ago, right? <laughs> it's paper. <laughs> so, so we see the value that blockchain can bring because now when the asset is being pulled off for maintenance, you're rotating the certificate and therefore the state change is recorded and all the nodes in the network and all no, the participants, they're aware of that uh, from that timestamp to that timestamp, the asset had undergone on a maintenance schedule, which is crucial for cybersecurity because that is when a lot of cyber attacks are mounted, when the asset custodianship shifts, Changes. and therefore an adversary can get access to the asset when the custodianship rotates. Um, so, so the use case is very powerful, but uh, like you pointed out, there's a lot of tooling that needs to be done. And, and key management, in my opinion, is a very crucial tooling uh, that many of the you know, enterprise blockchain platforms lack. Of course, the consumer platforms like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they throw the hand <laughs> up in the air and say, generate your own key, you know, uh, uh, you know just do a, you know, some random gen generation and, and yeah, make sure you're... you have to guarantee uniqueness also. Uh, so that's uh, another problem with a lot of these things, you know, where the key comes from, even with this uh, key value store kind of way of managing assets, yeah, yeah. it's not quite clear, you know, how do you guarantee that for any new asset you put into the system, into the blockchain network, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that the key value you assign is unique? So, uh, today, you know, nonce and this and that is being uh, thought of as Absolutely. a way of 
dealing with it, but that has its own set of problems. So. Because the consumer blockchain platforms had an anarchist ideology. They didn't want censor, they didn't want organization. It was a revolt against uh, censored organization. Whereas an enterprise can't run without organization. And therefore, your key management structure is a reflection of your organization. And when you're dealing with multiple organizations, you have to account for their individual organizational nuances. Um, and, and obviously today in the cloud world, you just go back to a Microsoft root CA or in the you know, industrial world, you have protocols like EST that you know, uh, networking vendors like Cisco support. And then you just uh, you know, move the certificates. But, but there, the, again, there is that more work going on in yeah. the space actually. In version one, they've done more things. In fact, in the blockchain as a service, which was originally called the IBM, what was it called? Uh, High Security HSBN, Business Network, yeah. HSBN. Uh, Everybody that was in the network, in a blockchain network, had to be part of the same Bluemix organization, which is kind of silly. Whereas in the IBM blockchain platform, which is the new version based on version one of the fabric, they can be nodes that are already pre-existing, that belong to different Bluemix different organizations, correct. and now you can combine them to form a blockchain network. Yeah. So things, some of these things are a point-in-time statement, as Emmanuel also pointed yeah. out, you yeah. know. As requirements come in, they are adding features. But it's one of these things where all this modern day way of doing things where you want to make available something really fast and make people try it out and learn from it and all that. Agile methodology, all this kind of stuff has its price as well as benefits, I guess. Absolutely. It looks like we are running out, of, out time. of time. Yeah. But I wanted to capture two aspects from, from your uh, kind of stream of thought. Uh, one is, uh, how, do you, how do you want you know, entrepreneurs and developers to engage with your kind of organizations and, and what you're trying to bring oh, yeah. together. In fact, um, I did want to say something on that one. IBM currently has, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, is somebody here that can give me the name? There, there's a, an offering right now that was sent out fairly a few weeks, ago, really a few weeks ago, which is an easy way to set up a two node network. I've forgotten the, the specific name for that thing. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Starter edition or whatever it's called. Um, uh, which allows you to uh, quickly try out stuff. It's for the time being free. And so that's one way to, uh, you know, get cracking with uh, playing around with the blockchain. Um, and also, of course, uh, you know, you can play around with uh, Composer 2 mm -hmm. as a, an easy way of developing an application and so on. It comes pre-packaged with certain choices being made for you. But if you want the fancier possibilities of, you know, the client deciding which subset of the endorsing peer should be involved in the simulation of a transaction and such things, you would have to then go down to the, you know, bare level and do the thing yourself instead of going through the uh, composer. Um, not much I can say because we're going GA in a couple of months. But overall, um, or or Oracle has its universal credits and obviously you can sign to Oracle get $300 free credit and use that to try out our BCS once, it's go, once it goes live. In addition, we, we are employing companies to work with us on our um, pre-release. They can sign up and be part of our pre-release and try out BCS. We have over 40 companies already using that right now. In addition to that, we're hiring. So <laughs> if you're a smart technologist, like solving very complex distributed system problems, and you're a cryptographer, do come and see me. I'd like to talk to you as well. Sanjay? So like, uh, uh, I have like two hats. One is like obviously uh, we believe that uh, Sawtooth is, the Hyperledger Sawtooth is pretty modular and uh, we for our part are uh, putting together the tools and things like that uh, to make it easier for people to uh, adopt and use. Uh, that's one. And the other one is uh, from the Ethereum Alliance perspective you will see a lot of push on uh, uh, common tools, uh, common ways of deployment, and uh, things like that, that, uh, that a standards body should do and uh, bring order to that place. Awesome, thanks a lot, guys. I'm really hoping the developer community part really picks up because how we saw cloud computing and big data succeed is because of these kinds of large developer communities come together. And all the way back to SQL, uh, which By I'm the way, sure Garage and such are also available in the case of IBM as a way of uh, smaller organizations uh, working with the IBM people. Angie Cackler is around. So if you go to the booth, uh, you can find out a lot more. 
So I'm really hoping blockchain becomes a developer movement, uh, especially in the enterprise world. Uh, I feel that's the only way we can really get together and, and solve some of these challenges that we discussed in the panel. Thanks a lot, Thank guys. You. Thanks a lot. Bye.